You don't remember Tin Ben Boo? No! The same thing happened in Algeria, in Africa. They didn't have anything but a rancor. The French had all these highly mechanized instruments of warfare. But they put some guerrilla action on them. Hello and welcome to a Guerrilla History Intelligence Briefing. Guerrilla History is the podcast that acts as a reconnaissance report of global proletarian history and aims to use the lessons of history to analyze the present. I'm your host, Henry Huckamacki, joined by my co-hosts, as always, Professor Adnan Hussein, historian and director of the School of Religion at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Hello, Adnan. How are you doing? Hi, Henry. I'm well. Thanks. Good to be with you. It's nice to see you as well. And also, as always, joined by Brett O'Shea, host of Revolutionary Left Radio and co-host of the Red Menace podcast. Hello, Brett. How are you doing today? Hello. I'm doing okay, all things considered. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting note to uh, open up on because that's really what we're going to be talking about, at least at the beginning of this conversation. So just as a reminder for listeners, intelligence briefings are roughly twice monthly bonus episodes that are primarily designed for our patrons. About half of them are early access to patrons on our Patreon, and half of them are uh, Patreon exclusives. We're going to be trying something today where we record an entire conversation at once, and uh, we put the thing up on Patreon in two chunks and then unlock the first half of it onto our general feed. So if you're listening to this on our general feed, uh, the conversation is going to get cut about halfway through the conversation, and the other half will be Uh, only on Patreon for people who help support the show and keep us running. So just so you're aware of what's going on. But the topic today uh, comes from one of our listeners who picked a topic that really flows well with some of the conversations that you've been having recently, Brett, on uh, Rev Left, as well as one of the questions that came in on a Red Menace uh, listener question, which is times are really tough right now, economically, Uh, especially in terms of the climate. And the question is, is with these tough times, especially looking down the barrel of potentially catastrophic climate change with no real political will in sight to try to overturn that, how do you stay optimistic and how do you stay motivated to keep trying to push for a better world when all of the cards seem stacked against you? And I thought that this was a really good question. And like I said, it flowed with some of the conversations that you'd been having, Brett. So Uh, That's where we'll start this conversation, and we'll just see where the conversation takes us. Brett, why don't I turn it over to you now, since you've been talking about this topic, and we can get some initial thoughts from you, uh, kind of maybe things that you've been reflecting on since you have been having these conversations over the past month, month and a half at this point. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is first, this is the baseline of this conversation, is the idea that we have a choice isn't really there. Um, we are in this position as conscious human beings that want to build a better world. Our lives, our futures, our families, our communities are all at stake in the sense that, you know, the worse that climate impact gets, the worse that the economy gets, the worse that anything gets is going to negatively impact us, the people we love, and people across the planet that we care about. So there is no option to opt out. Uh, if you're born into this world, this is the situation that we're in. And another thing that I, I really think is is crucial and something that you know I've been telling myself is, is not only do we not have a choice in the sense that we have to fight uh, in the conditions that we're given, but that pessimism, cynicism, fatalism, nihilism, these are ultimately reactionary. Uh, they're ultimately an example of of cowardice. That's not to say that I don't feel pessimistic at times or that cynicism doesn't get the best of me. But to let that take you over, to deactivate you, I think is a form of cowardice. And moreover, it's precisely what our worst enemies would want for us to do, to be so overwhelmed, so black-pilled um, by nihilism and fatalism that we cease to act. And that by by ceasing to act, we cede the ground to those who are looking forward to the chaos and taking advantage of it when it comes to fascists, um, when it comes to maintaining the status quo, which very much benefits the oligarchy, the imperialists, the elite, the world over. Um, and it's and it's a betrayal to be taken over by fatalism and nihilism, is a betrayal of every other human being on this planet. Um, we need all hands on deck. And so 
those two things, the lack of a choice and the fact that so much of fatalism and pessimism are just cowardice and reactionary misanthropy dressed up as some sort of rationalism are at least two ways that we could start this conversation and things that I've been thinking about lately. And Nan, why don't we turn it over to you now? Uh, how do you reflect on this moment politically and environmentally, especially considering that you have children? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a great question. You know, the IPCC report just uh, came out and there's been a lot of uh, discussion about how grim the picture looks ahead. And I think what's worse is that we don't really see a lot of signs of concerted and determined action by governments um, and the left forces seem incapable at this point in countries like the United States, Canada, you know, uh, other Western European countries and so forth, where there may be popular consciousness about uh, the significance of impending, well, or, you know, the climate crisis and catastrophe that is upon us to really have influence um, over these governments because they're no longer really democratic in a full sense of that word. They may be formally democratic, there are elections, but it seems that we keep being denied um, you know, governments that uh, actually seem to care. So in light of this, obviously, it's quite reasonable to be pessimistic. And it just reminds me of um, Gramsci, who, you know, um, Antonio Gramsci, the great Italian Marxist thinker, um, you know, had a little phrase that I'm sure many of our listeners have heard, which is, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. Um, so when you look with a cold, hard rationality at the circumstances, the conditions, the present status of, of you know, left-wing uh, forces, of course, you would have to be pessimistic because you need to have a realistic assessment of what you're facing. Um, but we still have to maintain some sense of optimism that there, if there's the political will, if we uh, will ourselves to continue to be engaged, as Brett said, that which you know we have no choice but to you know there's that can balance it um to some extent but um what i turn to um well i just want to add one other thing that is a little dispiriting at this particular moment um which is fragmentation even in the media culture of the left i mean there have been some very positive things that have developed in the last decade with alternative media. We always knew that corporate media was in the hands of capitalist forces. It was never going to portray and represent people's struggles and movements and tell us what's really happening and inform, you know, an active uh, community of workers and citizens that want to change the world for the better. So people started developing uh, online and through new technologies, through social media, uh, the ability to inform one another, to communicate, and to set our own agenda. And what I think has started to happen is that we've had a kind of culture of political celebrity. We've had, um, you know, uh, polemic and factional uh, sorts of fragmentation that is really undermining the um, value in some ways of the left media to be there for political education and to be an inspiration to activism. It seems that instead, people are spending an awful lot of time in a kind of entertaining tit for tat and argumentation. And this is, to my mind, somewhat dispiriting because while we might enjoy the arguments and um, we do need to be rigorous uh, on theoretical terms about the positions that we take, it's possible to make arguments and still be generous to one another and recognize that there are larger goals that it's very easy for us to be distracted from. We're already kind of weak and disorganized. And if we participate and contribute further by, you know, through egoistic or narcissistic, uh, you know, attacks on one another, you know, we're doing the work of the right wing. You know, the right wing is delighted to see, you know, the disarray that I think, um, uh, you know, we're facing. So, you know, I don't have good advice about how I can keep going because I also have, you know, periods of feeling quite depressed about where we are. Um, but what I look to in some ways as a historian and as someone involved in this project of guerrilla history is 
looking back at historical moments when you can see that um, people in the past faced even greater you know odds or you know i mentioned antonio gramsci the man was jailed for you know much of the career mo many of the best writings that have informed us that we study today he wrote in his prison notebooks this voluminous you know set of notes that he took um you know he's somebody who suffered under fascist you know uh, fascist governance in italy um but he maintained his uh, hope for the future and tried to contribute to it um as best he could so i think looking at historical episodes moments seeing that you know even if we feel isolated we're part of a longer historical process and a legacy of struggle that's keeping you know uh, the human human spirit uh, uh alive and engaged for the future uh, and that's all in some ways we can we can do so i'm hopeful that in some ways perhaps guerrilla history um, provides a little bit of, you know, inspiration and um, education that can help people through what are clearly very dark times. I guess where I'm, I'm coming from this from is, as, as we've been saying, it's very easy to get pessimistic about where we are right now. And as the youngest person on the show, I'm 26, the impending climate catastrophe is very worrying. I know that this is something I'm going to have to live with the rest of my life. Even if we take incredible mitigation strategies right now, a lot of the harm that we've already done is irreparable. We can avoid, if we take dramatic measures, the most calamitous scenarios that are being mapped out by some of these organizations that are doing climate modeling. But much of the damage that's been done is already locked in stone. And I'm going to have to live with that for the rest of my life. So it's very easy to become pessimistic about things like the climate. It's also very easy to be pessimistic about politics more generally. Being from the United States originally, uh, we look at the, the, the political situation of the country. And every once in a while, we get a representative or a senator who seems like they might be rolling the ball in the right direction. You know, they're not where I want them, certainly. But once in a while, it seems like there's going to be a representative who might be going in the right, right direction. But in the House of Representatives, 435 members, there's 100 members in the Senate. Even if you have one person who might be right on a particular topic, the vast majority of the forces of capital that are represented within the legislative body are going to completely snowball them uh, so that even their voice is being hidden. And we know that the media also plays a role in this. Adnan, you just pointed that out. The corporate media is not going to allow those dissenting opinions to be heard by the mass populace because who knows, some of them might be popular. So being from a place originally like the United States, where we know that as the hegemonic power, as things stand, you know, who knows how long that's going to go on for, but as the hegemonic power, as things stand, as the leading imperialist country in the world, in order to create a better world, we have to change the United States. It only does so much to have national liberation in, you know, this country or that country. It only does so much for a socialist government to take power in this country or that country, these periphery countries. Until you have dramatic change in the imperial core, particularly in places like the United States, you're not going to solve the global problem because the United States is driving those problems, both in terms of emissions from the United States, right, you know, if we're talking about the environment, or ensuring that we don't have a left-wing movement that sweeps up through many countries globally. The United States stands in opposition to those exact movements that we need to come in power globally to prevent the kind of catastrophes that are coming barreling down at us. So it's very easy to be pessimistic, incredibly easy. But if we're addressing the question of how do we stay optimistic, there are some things that we can look at. I always like to look at some previous movements where things looked absolutely hopeless. And this is kind of, I think you were alluding to this, Adnan, uh, at least a little bit. Um, Lenin, for example, said that there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen. 
currently we're in a political moment where it seems like very little is happening. You know, we have this representative come into power, hey, they're better than the person that they replaced. But really in the grand scheme of things, is anything happening politically in the United States? I would argue no. And again, this is, you, you could say this for almost every country, but let's focus on the United States just because of the, the overwhelming sway that they have on the global stage. It seems like nothing is happening. And if we're entirely focused on this representative or that senator or this person who's running for president, we're going to be stuck in this rut where nothing really changes. We need to understand that in order to get to these changes that we know we need and we need soon, we need this dramatic rupture where we see decades happen in a period of weeks. Lenin was leading this relatively small band of people against a dynasty that had been in place in Russia for a very long time and was immensely wealthy, whereas most of the people in Russia were incredibly poor, illiterate, starving, overworked. And yet what happened? You know, it looked for the longest time that this movement was going to do nothing, but eventually they succeeded. Or let's look at Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was fighting for Vietnamese national liberation against the French originally, right? And things looked pretty, not very good. I mean, if you looked at what the French were able to bring to the table militarily and economically versus what the Vietnamese had, it looked kind of helpless. That's why Ho Chi Minh literally wrote to the United States asking for help in their national liberation struggle back in 54-ish, saying things like, Abraham Lincoln said this, and this would support national liberation. Come on, United States, this is in your DNA. And the United States says, uh, our DNA is rooted in upholding the imperialist order. And only at that point did Ho Chi Minh understand the United States was not a friend. It was not going to be a friend. It was never going to be a friend of a national liberation, anti-imperialist struggle in Southeast Asia. So when he realized that, he decided he was going to take on the United States too. Now you're looking at Vietnam against the French and then the United States. But what happened? Ho Chi Minh was victorious. You know, the Vietnamese were victorious in their national liberation. Let's look at Cuba. Cuba, this tiny nation, 11 million people, very poor, was controlled by uh, with an iron fist by a military dictatorship propped up by the United States. It had all kinds of money flowing in and out by the mafia from the United States. The United States government was propping up the government there. Fidel, Raul, Che, uh, Camilo Cienfuegos, they came in, they were successful. But then, ever since then, the United States has been trying to crush Cuba. It looks like a hopeless situation, right? You have the United States completely strangling this small, poor country. And those people can persist. Those people can persevere despite the overwhelming situation that's leveled against them. And then let's look at Gramsci again, as you mentioned, Adnan. Gramsci was in prison for a decade writing his greatest works. He was literally seeing his own teeth rot out of his face while he was writing his prison notebooks. But yet he still had the optimism of the will. He was still able to persevere. And if he can persevere through watching his own teeth fall out of his face while he's locked in a fascist prison, if Ho Chi Minh can persevere against the French and the United States, if the people of Cuba can persevere against an economic blockade that's been going on illegally for decades, if Lenin can overturn the royal family of Russia, we can persist. We can fight against the imperialist order that we're living in. We can fight against the impending climate catastrophe, and we must. That's how I stay motivated. I look at these moments from history where things look helpless, and they persevered, and they won. Okay, rant over. Brett, why don't I turn things back over to you? Where do you want to go with this? Yeah, no, I, I love all of that. And I think it's it's really important to remember that quote from Lenin about decades happening within weeks is is always at the front of my mind. A, a book I read recently is, is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, who is literally in the concentration camps, watching everybody around him die, barely made it out, um, and comes out and, and has this contribution to humanity through his work after the fact. Um, so it ain't over till it's over. And I think that's that's really important. 
another thing that, that does give me hope, and this last IPCC report has, has shown us this, there has been some actions taken. It's not fast enough. It's not nearly enough. But the modeling has gotten better and act, sufficient amount of actions have been taken to at least say that the most, the worst case scenario from the last IPCC report is off the table. Um, that's a little glimmer, a little glimmer of something like hope and optimism to have at least the worst case scenario chopped off the, the, the end of, of that possibility spectrum. But what's going to happen is we're not going to get the best case scenario, i.e. keeping it below 1.5. And we're not going to get the worst case scenario, i.e. some sort of apocalyptic four degree plus by the end of the century scenario. What's going to happen, as with so many human endeavors, is we're going to be somewhere in the middle. Our job is to fight as hard as we fucking can to move that closer to the best case trajectory and to keep it under two degrees of warming. But even at that level, there's no these these thresholds of one point five or two degrees of warming. These are ultimately arbitrary. They're nice, you know, full numbers that we can say, let's try to keep it below this. But every 0.1 degree of warming that we prevent is a victory. And not only, it's not just a left project, right? And, and that's this also gives me a little bit of hope if we're talking about some general optimism. Uh, rich people don't want to live on a burning planet. <laughs> you know? um, politicians don't want to live on a burning planet. There is a, there is a loud and vocal minority of people, especially on the far right, that already have and will continue to retreat into conspiratorial and alternative realities where this isn't happening, or if it is, it's the fault of insert enemy here. Uh, that's going to happen. But most people do not deny reality, and specifically young people coming up. Henry, you mentioned that you're, you're 26. I'm 32. I have two children. It was their first day of first grade and seventh grade today, respectively. I have another child on the way. I have multiple nieces and nephews. Already, the, the older kids are aware that this is happening, um, and they're, they're not going to sit back and let their futures be destroyed. They don't have the luxury, like some Fox News boomer does, to retreat into a false reality of, of fever dreams and conspiratorial thinking. And so as uh, these young people come up, there's going to be an increasing amount of pressure. As we see the impacts of climate change, there's going to be an increasing amount of pressure just over the last year. A uh, recent polling from Gallup has showed that for the first time, climate change has broken into the top three issues that Americans care about because they're looking at the wildfires, they're looking at the heat waves, they're looking at the droughts, and they're saying this in impacts me personally. The only other, <laughs> interestingly, the only other issue that was above climate change in the recent Gallup poll was healthcare. Um, these are two winning issues that the left has championed for years and years and years and will continue to champion going forward. Another little layer of optimism, and I say this just to fight against the worst aspects of black pill nihilism, is that we've done a lot of irreparable damage without a doubt. But nature is also astoundingly resilient. If given half a chance, it will bounce back. We have we have done things like tackled the ozone problem, which was uh, you know turning out to be an existential crisis decades ago. We've stopped the uh, the problem and even reversed it in some respects. There have been uh, species that are going extinct almost every day, but there have been species that have been brought back from the brink by conscious human intervention and the stopping of bad human um, actions. That's going to continue. Farming, this is a core of any human civilization. Farms all over the world realize that they're hyper exploitative, soil depleting, you know, spray fertilizer on everything way of, of agriculture is, is, is an already dead form. And that regenerative forms of agriculture are absolutely necessary. And nature is forcing us to look at those ways of doing things. So all of these things are going to continue to develop and intensify alongside the negative aspects. Now, when you go on um, 24 hour news or, or you go to the headlines, you're going to see horror stories till the day you die. Um, that's true. And even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, uh, as Henry alluded to, we have another 20 or 30 years of warming baked into the system already. Um, so it, it's, it's not going to be pretty. But at the same time, sometimes focusing on those headlines, which are sensationalist and get clicks, can take away from having a balanced perspective of all the other developments that are happening alongside those negative ones. And so it's not going to be the best case scenario, but it's also not going to be the worst case scenario. Um, it's not going to be the end of humanity as we know it. It's not going to be extinction, but it is going to be a radical transformation. 
Will this radical transformation end in a better, more equitable, more sustainable planet for all living beings? Or will that radical transformation be something like sending humanity back a couple centuries? That's the fight. Those are the stakes. That's what's on the line here. And to, to look at that and to give up, to say, I, I, I don't have anything to do. I'm not going to participate in trying to make a better world. That's fundamentally cowardice, even despite the fact that we all have pessimism and we all struggle with cynicism. We all struggle with depression and anxiety. I have eco depression. I have eco anxiety. I, I'm grieving for the loss of the biosphere. I break out in tears randomly throughout the day um, in the face of, of what's happening globally. Uh, but that, that should just provoke me to continue to do everything I can um, to, to push the envelope in the other direction, not deactivate me. We can't let any of this deactivate us. And, and that's essential. You know, this is such an important conversation because we're all dealing with this. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you had a couple of uh, episodes of Rev Left to talk with people about it and have in introduced this because, um, you know, I found it very helpful, to be honest, uh, to hear how others are feeling. Um, you know, we're often isolated and we're just talking about the issues. But, you know, behind that, it isn't easy to always keep going and finding the energy in the face of, you know, the grim reality uh, we're dealing with. So I find actually also just being able to talk honestly about these struggles that we have internally also how to stay motivated, how to stay engaged. Obviously what we really need to, I mean, and I actually, what I come down to is feeling on some level that I just wouldn't be able to live without the struggle. You know, like, could you just shut down and say, well, look, I, you know, I'm going to just deal with the material struggles in my life and I'm not going to engage and try and educate and try and uh, put political pressure or organize. I, you know, Maybe everybody's different, but I feel like even anybody with a conscience, with a sense of morality and ethical principles, which everybody on the left should be coming, you know, to this uh, work and to those positions from a place of those kinds of principles of caring, of empathy for others, of a sense of justice. You can't really shut that down. You may be pessimistic and you may turn away for periods sometimes you may need rest from the intensity you can, it's possible to burn out we cannot be so obsessed that we're unhealthy and we aren't balanced and that we burn out and then are useless for the future struggle uh, sometimes you need those breaks that's understandable but to really actually shut off your ethical kind of conscience and to just allow despair to turn you to disengagement in a fundamental uh, way, I think that's actually impossible for people of conscience. So you can't really live without this struggle. Um, the real thing is, how do we engage in it in ways that preserve our energy and don't uh, burn us out? And you know, what are the sources of rejuvenation? Um, we need to be aware of those things, I think. Everybody needs to be aware of those things. I mean, for me, and I think maybe, you know, Brett, you might have a lot to say on this as, as well as obviously having some sense of a spiritual orientation that aligns your emotional kind of inner life with your politics is important. And it's something, of course, that the left isn't always that comfortable discussing because we don't want to mystify you know we're engaging in, in in changing reality not just you know the imaginations of our own you know condition or, or creation um, but you have to have something it seems that is an outlet for um, rejuvenating your spirit your sense of optimism your uh, energy and willingness to engage and i think for many people it's also something very social is having meaningful emotional connections with people that you're engaged in in struggle with doing things together involving in projects locally where you can cooperate and collaborate directly i know it's been very difficult during the pandemic but as things open up we hope that there will be more community-based activity that people can be engaged with one another we need to when we come back into our you know social worlds and in our communities be carrying over these ideas because there are a lot of opportunities right now for people who are going to be engaged and active in your local community. 
Um, and that's maybe a place where you can also see positive changes and developments. We know that, of course, uh, this situation requires grander, large scale transformation. But in terms of keeping us involved and engaged uh, and uh, looking toward a, a livable future for ourselves and for future generations, coming together and working in local projects on small things in your civic communities, you know, parks, um, mutual aid, um, you know, these kinds of support systems and engaging with other people, I find it's also very therapeutic. So I've been involved with some of these things in my local community this summer, and um, that's really sustaining. And for other people, it is also maybe yoga or, you know, um, other kinds of disciplines for meditation and things where you can kind of recenter yourself, recover, and then re-engage. Um, these, I think, are really important um, to keep us sustained over the longer term because it's, it's going to be a long struggle. That's, uh, that's something we can all agree on. I'll just come in and say briefly that I agree with everything that you're saying, Adnan, that um, having some sort of spiritual background could be useful and that really engaging in a community is important. Um, I myself don't have that kind of spiritual grounding, but I certainly am engaged within community, uh, community building, community activities. The pandemic has made it hard, as you mentioned, but, you know, previously I was in engaged in many struggles um, in, in my community, uh, in, you know, different ways that you would construct community. There was different communities that I was involved in. But one thing that also motivates me is beyond the fact that I know that it is possible for us to break out of the seemingly impossible death spiral of capitalism, imperialism, and climate change. Um, I, I know that it is possible based on you know, historical examples, like some of the ones that I laid out through some theoretical uh, examples, uh, like, for example, I believe it's in chapter 10 of Capital, uh, Marx writes that the tendency of the capitalist class is to try to increase the number of working hours to the point where they're going to uh, extract the most amount of surplus value from the workers as possible. It's through workers' struggles that we actually have a reduction in the working hours over the day, which has been borne out through history. We look at the, the, the data. Yeah, I see Adnan says yes to chapter 10. Okay, there we go. Uh, as, as these workers' struggles go on, and we have empiric da uh, empirical data of this, workers' struggles, workers struggles and the resulting legislation as a result of some of these workers' struggles are what reduce the, the amount of working hours in the day. And then, of course, you know, we have the conversation about relative surplus value and how that plays into this. And but we're, we're going to leave that aside for now. The point is, is that by struggling, we can make change. But something that also motivates me, and it's probably not the best thing to have as a motivating factor, I, I'll be interested to see what you have to say about this, both of you, but is anger. Because I, I see the injustices in society. Uh, and I, I understand the injustices that are taking place by, for example, corporations who are selling our future in order to make profit in the short term by, you know, donating to candidates who are going to uh, cut environmental regulations, for example, just a very, very obvious example, something that happens every single election cycle. The, the companies that produce most of the environmentally uh, hazardous, dangerous, uh, degrading chemicals, they always find candidates who are going to cut any sort of regulations that would inhibit them from extracting the most amount of profit possible from their, their production processes, and they put the money to them. They know that they're harming the environment. They know that people like me and like your children, Brett's children, uh, they know that we are the ones who are going to bear the cost of this. It's just an externality to them, something that they don't even have to think about. And that makes me angry because they know, they know. The same thing with the cigarette companies. They knew that the cigarettes were causing lung cancer. 
And they hid that intentionally in order to keep making the profit. These things make me angry. Imperialism makes me angry. When I see the US and France involved in West Africa, just look at what's been happening in Mali recently. They've had coup after coup after coup, literally coups within coups, led by the same people, cooing themselves in order to, you know, lock down more power. No, I'm serious. I see, you know, Adnan, you're laughing, but this is literally what's happening. There's the coup, guy comes into power, didn't, he realized he didn't have enough power, so he leads another coup. Well, he's already in power in order to consolidate power. I mean, it's crazy. And the conditions for that are set up by American and French imperialism in West Africa both within Mali itself, as well as the surrounding countries, <clears throat> Libya being a very obvious example of this. These things make me angry. And that's what motivates me to continue to fight against it. Because one, I know that change is possible, right? So that's kind of the optimistic side of things. But then I also have this pent up rage that there are people that are intentionally causing harm to people that they see as less worthy of humanity than themselves for their own benefit. And that anger is something that, that drives me. And I know that that's probably not the best motivation, but uh, you know, it's something that drives me. I don't know if either of you have anything that you want to say about that, because I know that, you know, you're not supposed to act as a result of anger. You get told that ever since you're, you know, two years old or whatever, but that, that's something that is, uh, has always been a driving force behind my activism and whatnot. The things that make me angry are the things that I speak out about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an unavoidable part of, of having a conscience in a world that's so fundamentally unjust. And anger, I mean, I feel violent rage. I feel like disgusting feelings of like murderous revenge. When I look even today at like politicians who want to dance around the subject or say we don't know enough, or just when I think about every single right winger I've ever debated with for the last 15 years, who, you know, all the way through were climate denialists until it's just undeniable. And then they shifted a little bit. Well, maybe humans aren't causing it. And then that's proven to be false. Like, well, there's nothing we can really do. I mean, these people are in every sense of the word fucking evil. And there's two types of climate denialists. There are the cynical scumbag lying snakes of Exxon and Republican politicians who know better and then spend their money, time and energy muddying the water so they can continue to extract as much profit out of the situation as possible. I mean, those people in any just society deserve to be publicly executed, in my humble opinion. Um, and then there are the useful idiots, the people who, because of their already pre-existing ideological commitments, um, maybe just don't really know and are wanting deep down ideologically to, I mean, they don't really want to challenge capitalism anyway. And so, you know, it's a nice narrative to, to take on board and their side saying it. And so they really, they're not really lying, but they're sort of like the useful idiots of the snakes at the top of the hierarchy that are lying. Those people I have le no patience for, but less violent rage toward. Um, but at the same time, I realize the limitations of those feelings of, of rage and, and revenge and hatred that I have in small order. They're important motivators. Um, as you say, I'm, I'm enraged in the face of any injustice. But then I try to balance that with a love of all the people that are innocent, that, you know, are, want to be good in the world, that are that are being hurt by these very people. And that love-hate balance, I think, is an interesting dichotomy to play with. You don't want to get burned up in nothing but hate such that you lose your ability to love and see the other side of the people you're fighting for, the, the future of humanity that you want to live good, healthy lives. And so whenever I'm feeling too burnt up with that rage, I try to counterbalance it with love and gratitude for the things in my life and the people in the world that I do care about. And I think if you can maintain that balance – that's an important motivator on both ends, but you don't get too tilted into either naivete, um, you know, or into into a, a sort of rudderless rage that that doesn't do much for anybody except kind of hurt you in the in the process. Because feeling rage and, and feelings of needing to get revenge actually eat you up from the inside. They're not pleasant emotions, <laughs> um, so you don't want them to to get too out of control. But I would say importantly before I hand it off to Adnan, and I have plenty of other things to say, but on this one point, it's essentially crucial that we don't let our compassion die. 
Um, there is such a thing as compassion fatigue. There is such a thing as seeing so much tragedy and, and unnecessary suffering that you sort of get burnt out on your ability to feel compassion at all. Uh, that's a natural process. I and mean, there's only so much that that emotion can take. And that's where I think either conscious spiritual practices that consciously cultivate compassion can come in or getting embedded in your community such that you see day to day the people's lives that depend on you making a better world and that can generate a compassion as well so don't let this system destroy your empathy and compassion um, because that's honestly what it seeks to do in so many ways the nihilism the hyper misanthropy we see sometimes humans are cancer fuck them that is your compassion being slaughtered by the powers that be that want to maintain the status quo. It's revolutionary to maintain radical love and compassion in, in the face of that. And then the, one more thing I just wanted to say about plus the spiritual stuff and the anger motivation is I find it very helpful to spend as much time as you possibly can in nature alone, go on walks and it doesn't have to be crazy. You don't have to go like on seven day camps, go, go out to a lake, go kayaking, walk through the woods, marvel at the beauty of the natural world and embed that love deep into your soul. And you won't ever have a question of whether or not you want to fight for it. Um, it is, it is just so part and parcel with who you are at a certain point uh, that defending it is as natural as sleeping and eating. Um, and in, in that sense, we become the earth fighting for itself. We're not separate from this thing. When we seek to protect the biodiversity of, of the, the planet, we bubble up out of the planet. We are the planet fighting for itself, seeking to heal itself. And that in and of itself can be a very powerful motivator and, and hedge against the worst of burnout. Yeah, I want to echo everything that you said. And I just want to clarify that. Uh, my anger is because of my love and empathy for my fellow man. Uh, it's not completely separate from that. Like I'm not angry for the sake of being angry. It's because I love my my comrades, my my community. It's because I feel empathy for the people that have injustices against them that I feel this rage. Um, and I'm just going to say the obligatory uh, Che Guevara quote, if you tremble with in indignation at every injustice, then you are a comrade of mine. That's that's really the tack that I try to take here. Now, Adnan, I'm going to turn this over to you now, but I'm actually going to cut the episode right here so that this part will be going out on our general feed. So if you're hearing this at the end of the general feed to hear the rest of the conversation, uh, be sure to sign up for our Patreon uh, patreon.com forward slash gorilla history g-u-e-r-r-i-l-l-a history uh, by joining our patreon you're supporting the show helping us continue doing what we're doing helping us pay for platform fees and resource uh, research materials and whatnot so it's it's really helpful if you do sign up for there and uh, patrons uh, in one second you'll hear or actually I'll, I'll put up the second half next week on our patreon so Patrons, you'll hear the continuation of this conversation uh, next week.